so yes, I'm going to talk about replication studies. Um, and uh, as, as was already mentioned over the past few years, um, the question whether replications would be a useful addition to existing scholarly practices in the humanities has become indeed a topical one. It's a question that has made it to the pages of nature even. And I think that is telling. Uh, telling because it seems at the same moment to point to the uh, importance of the issue. Why else would such a high profile journal be interested in this? And to a certain remoteness from practice in the humanities itself, since uh, nature is not the peri periodical of choice for most scholars from the humanities, I would say. Um, the answer to this question, to the desirability and the feasibility of replications in the humanities, has been an uh, an equivocal yes, for example, by uh, the next speaker, Rick Bills, as well as as as, as Lex, Lex Balter. Um, but this unequivocal yes has also been answered by an equally unequivocal no from uh, amongst other Sarah de Rijke. And my answer today will be a yes with restrictions. Yes, replications can be useful in the humanities, but we have to acknowledge the limitations of its use, limitations which we can only fully assess if we first try it out. Um, and to get to this point, I will follow in my talk four steps. First, I will have a look at the rise of replications over the past decade. Secondly, I will have a look at the definitions and variable types and understanding of replications that are. Thirdly, I will uh, see um, how, uh, if and how these notions translate to the humanities. And fourth and finally, uh, I will answer the, my main question and sketch what I see as the possibilities for replication in the humanities. In discussing this question, I will draw my examples solely from my own discipline, um, history, and for now I will assume that it stands for most of the humanities disciplines. Um, so that is the map for this talk. Um, so let me move on then first to the rise of replication studies. Um, in the 2010s, uh, we have witnessed uh, what has been called a reproducibility crisis. Uh, just to sketch it, according to Nature's 2016 survey among 1500, over 1,500 researchers, there were 52% of them who identified a significant crisis, while another 38% agreed with the diagnosis of a slight crisis. And this survey followed upon disturbing reports about the very limited level of reproducibility of many findings from 40% to as low as 10%. Um, and when these respondents to the survey were asked about the causes of this lack of reproducibility of research outcomes, they named factors such as bad mentoring, selective reporting, publication pressure, poor research design, poor analysis, as well as outright fraud. This, and this is probably no surprise to today's audience, the lack of reproducibility fitted in larger concerns about research integrity. It was connected to serious forms of scientific norm violation, both fraud and questionable research practices, as well as to a hyper-competitive science system that is often blamed for causing these infractions. And obviously, this replication crisis, and we know that as well, has triggered a response in disciplines such as psychology, but that's just one. This has led first to diagnosing the extent of this crisis uh, and looking for its causes, and then in the next step to performing actual replication studies. Similarly, institutions in the science system have formulated their own response. So in the Netherlands, we can think of, for example, the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, the KNAW, the KNAW, as well as the Dutch Research Council, NWO, who have addressed the issue. So in a report on the issue from 2018, the KNAW recommended that methods re re reporting, data sharing, that they should be improved, as well as calling for more incentives to encourage scientists to actually engage in replication work. And by then, NWO, NWO had already heeded that call and started a funding program specifically for replications. And the, what I just mentioned, these, these aforementioned diagnosis and proposed solutions seem to be quite widely held, as, become, as becomes clear, for example, from the Manifesto for Reproducible Sciences by Munafo and others. Um, and it, they show how much the principles of reproducible science are aligned with broader principles of open science, open data, transparent methods, open communication, and dissemination of results, different incentive and reward structures, to name but a few. So in short, uh, we can understand the reproducibility crisis as part of a larger crisis, or at least a sense of crisis or integrity crisis in science, and its proposed solutions are in line with the more general initiatives that often, but not entirely, sail under the flag of open science. So the fact that reproducibility crisis became part of a more structural crisis or seen as such in science makes it no surprise that questions of replication and replicability 
extended beyond the social and biomedical sciences where they had most clearly and publicly initiated. In 2018, so that's two years ago, the question of whether the humanities too needed a replication drive was raised. And what is important to note here, I think, and this is something that I will continue to stress uh, in, my, in my talk, is that for the humanities, this question was not preceded, as had been the case in the examples I just mentioned, it had not been preceded by a, le a lack of reproducibility or a perceived lack of reproducibility in research outcomes in the humanities. By proposing the solution of replications, the problem of lacking reproducibility was assumed rather than proven. And this is important, I think, because it might contribute to skeptical reactions on the side of scholars from the humanities. The call for replication could, rightfully or unrightfully, so could be perceived as yet again a practice from the sciences, the natural social sciences, that is advised and implanted into the humanities without taking into account disciplinary or sufficiently taking into account disciplinary differences. Just one other example, I think, from the realm of open science would be open access publishing that might be a perfect fit for the science sciences with their article only dissemination, but fits much worse in the book culture that still prevails in many disciplines in the humanities. But that for the rise of the replication studies and the rise of this question. Moving on to what replication is. Um, in the report by the academy that I just mentioned already, replication study is defined as follows. A replication study, and I quote, a replication study is a study that is an independent repetition of an earlier published study using similar methods and conducted under similar circumstances. The idea, quite obvious idea behind replication and the reproducibility, re reproducibility of findings in empirical dis disciplines being that these findings should be reproducible. In other words, if an experiment is conducted in one time and place, then a similar experiment should yield the same outcome at another time and place. So here I would say a replication study is then conceived as a procedure, a procedure that is used to test the validity of earlier research findings. And of course, that's a quite plausible position, almost intuitive, I would say. But there may be a rather deceptive simplicity about the idea of replication as a procedure, as a historian of science, which is my background. My view would probably be, probably be a little less optimistic, a little more gloomy. And I would tend to think that replication is maybe not only conceived as a procedure, but also as an outcome or uh, of a process or even an achievement. And um, this is already indicated, I think, in the use of the word similar multiple times in the definition, which, of course, leaves room for endless discussions whether a replication study is indeed similar and what similar then may mean. And one need only think, for example, of the psychologist, uh, this is just one example, Fritz Strack, who came up with all kinds of objections when his famous smile experiment um, uh, did not yield, uh, when repl replications of his famous smile experiment did not yield the same outcomes in replication studies. So this is the study that you may have heard of, 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 of um, uh, people having a pencil between the teeth uh, and then reading comics. So having a smile already and then finding these comi comics funnier. So the facial feedback hypothesis as it's known. Um, so, and he came up with all kinds of objections why uh, um, the, 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 the replication wasn't actually a replication because the comics had changed, the people had changed over 30 years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so my remark, a small objection here is, as philosophers of science will immediately recognize much informed by the so-called duham quine thesis, but I will leave these difficulties, which I think there are, I will leave them aside for now. And I will move on to different types of replications that have been distinguished often in three types. So Pills and Bauter um, use the same categories as NWO used in the program. So first category would be replication with existing data sets. A second would be direct replication. So that would then be a collection of new data uh, with, a, uh, with the same study protocol. And there would be thirdly conceptual replication, collection of new data with a modified study protocol. As uh, another author puts it, direct replication then is a way, and I quote, to evaluate the ability of a particular method to produce, produce the same results upon repetition, whereas conceptual replication then serves to test the same theoretical idea using an intentionally different method than previous studies. So in terms of the SMILE experiment, I just mentioned I would then, I would translate these different types of replications to be first, simply use Strux data and redo his analysis. Second, direct application would then be following Strux study protocol of showing cartoons to test cases 
having or not having a pencil in their mouth uh, between the teeth and, and find whether the outcomes of this experiment are the same. And third conceptual um, replication would then be designing a new experiments with the idea of facial feedback hypothesis tested as well. So, for example, you could let people slice onions and then let them watch comics or the final scene from Titanic, for example, and see how that affects their uh, uh, their mood. Um, so that about replication, then let me move on to the third part. How does replication then translate to the humanities or does it translate? Um, if replication can come in these different guises, then, then does it apply to the humanities? If we look at Pills and Bouter, if I understand them correctly, in their calls for replication drive, they seem to put most of their money on conceptual replication. And if I then translate conceptual replication uh, to historical terms, um, then I would imagine a historian who dives into, for, let's say, the causes of the French Revolution. And for that, uh, to, to, to study this cause of the French Revolution, for that to use a new type of sources, to, to use um, uh, a different study protocol, so to say. Uh, so one could think of a historian who does not no longer solely rely on written accounts of the past, but rather adds material sources, such as the clothing revolutionaries wore or the symbols they carried in their marches, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as such, I think conceptual replication is very important. It is very laudable, but also something that historians, I think, already very much do. For example, the discussion on the origins and cause of the French Revolution, what historians would call then the historiographical debate, has been raging on for over 200 years now with historians coming up with new types of sources, new types of readings of these sources over and over. So you could say conceptual replication is well established practice within the discipline of history. But if that is the case, if this is established practice already, then it remains to me, it would remain questionable whether historians would subscribe to the goals of replication as defined by the proponents of replication in humanities, such as Pills and Bouter, namely, and I quote them on this, that, this, that replication is an epistemic process meant to assess the likelihood that the results of an original study are correct. What seems implied here is that there is one correct outcome, although a later formulation by the same authors that we should, quote, uh, find a set of right answers that are compatible, seems to leave a little more room for multiple correct answers. Um, but I think that historians, many historians would have difficulties uh, that there would be such an outcome that could be defined as the correct one. And I think what is at stake here is a collision of knowledge ideals that becomes clear if we look at the translation of direct replication in historical terms. To stick to the French Revolution, I think a possible example of a direct replication would be if a historian would investigate the cause of the French Revolution using the same research question, using the same sources uh, as an earlier historian. So, and if such an investigation were to be undertaken, I have no knowledge of that this has been done, but if such an investigation were to be undertaken, I do not doubt that historians would be very, very, very much surprised if historian B would come up, would come up with the same conclusions or the same outcome uh, and thus come to a successful replication of historian A. So the surprise would be if someone would come up with the same outcome. Rather, I think historians would expect, and probably scholars in humanities in a broader sense as well, would expect that this would lead to different outcomes. So why would this be the case? First, first, and this also pertains to the earlier idea of a one correct outcome, historians tend to see the discipline as some form of, I would say, institutionalized disagreement, famously summed up in the bon mot of history as an argument without end. Secondly, the knowledge ideal driving historians is one of a, I would say, deliberate, albeit limited, subjectivity. Um, uh, in short, um, the subjective nature of an often but not exclusively hermeneutical discipline such as history is not necessarily seen as a hindrance or a threat to the researcher's integrity or to researcher's procedures. Rather, the subjectivity is seen as unavoidable and more positively even as enabling the process of interpretation in the first place. In terms of the example, it would come as no surprise if a 19th century political conservative French historian would come up with a different reading of the cause of the French Revolution than a 20th century, 20th century Russian Marxist historian. And what is more, these different interpretations would not be considered problematic 
but rather encouraged as a necessary proliferation of interpretations. And this is exactly the critique that came from the Reich and others in the reply to Pales and Bauter. The humanities, and I quote them, allow for multiple valid answers and because of the value of their interaction, so this proliferation of interpretations and how they interact, they disqualify replication as a viable quality criterion. So at this point in my talk, it may seem as if I am arguing against replication in the humanities or against replication in history, which is, of course, not what I promised when I started. Um, and maybe I have also been a little too harsh on the next speaker because in his latest article on the topic, he seems somewhat more for coming to different knowledge ideals, acknowledging that every replication is a matter of degree and that some hermeneutic interpretations may not be replicated because they simply imply too much uh, controversial background assumptions. Um, also, there is more than simply establishing the correctness of research account, uh, outcomes to, to, that seems to be at stake for Pills and Bauter. According to them, performing replications, replications can also help, and I quote uh, once again, filter out faulty reasoning or misguided interpretations, draw attention to a noticed crucial difference in study methods, and detect the use of flawed research methods. And I think it's more, I, I think in these kind of goals in this line, that I think where the opportunity of replication in the humanities lies. Let me explain this by ditching the French Revolution as an example now and turning to the example of vibrators and orgasms. Um, because in her famous and admittedly rather spectacular 1999 book, The Technology of Orgasm, the historian Rachel Maines had made the claim that doctors in the, the spectacular claim had made that doctors in the Victorian age had routinely used vibrators for clitor clitoral stimulation to induce an orgasm as a form of therapy for patients who had been diagnosed as hysterical. Um, the doctors were able to perform this act, Mains argued, because it was seen as a non-sexual act at the time because it didn't involve penetration. And Mains' book in the, the ensuing decades has had a very wide appeal, both scholarly, scholarly it received prizes from uh, the American Historical Association, for example, as well as in popular culture. Um, two years ago, however, two other historians, Halle Lieberman and Eric Schatzberg, published an article which gave a devastating judgment of Mainz's original study. They could not reproduce the findings by Mainz at all. Lieberman and Schatzberg had engaged in what is probably uh, the historical equivalent of a direct replication. They had consulted the sources Mainz had used and could simply find no supporting evidence for these claims. What counted as established facts proved false. As Lieberman and Schatzberg wrote, we could find no evidence and that sums it all up. So what we have here is a case of a direct replication trying to reproduce the findings of original study through using the same sources. Now, what can we learn from this uh, about the value of replications in history? First, I think that replication studies can serve as a way to detect scholarly norm violation. In her response, Mainz retreated to a more provisional, provisional tone, stating that she had presented her work as a hypothesis, but this provisional tone had been rather well hidden in her original work. So it seems a weak defense. A possible counter-argument could be that these cases of norm violations are extremely rare in history. And of course, we tend to hear these kinds of responses every time fraud pops up, and that they were extremely rare. But I think we have to be very honest here as historians. We simply do not know if this happens more often. We have no clue uh, about that. That we have not detected these kinds of norm violation does not mean that they are not there. Lieberman and Schatzberg themselves immediately praised their findings in the framework of a research integrity crisis, malfunctioning peer review, and the science system that creates publication pressure are not limited to the social and biomedical sciences, they, they argued. So they expect, they expect more of these cases to arise. And once again, the answer has, has to be, we cannot know. So we can also not be as, as assured as Lieberman and Schatzberg are. We cannot know if this is isolated or not because we have not been looking for it because since, as, as far as I know, we have not systematically performed these kinds of direct replication studies. So I think that's an increase in integrity would be a first possible benefit or first benefit of replications. Second, if we would follow Mainz's response, we could, we could come up with a different line of reasoning if we are more charitable to her. If we do not understand this to be a binary case, fraud or non-fraud, but rather as one of degree, we would get a different image. Then we would be looking at a very, very bold interpretation of source material, you could say, and we would have a new question. 
at what point, and the question of boundaries, at what point does an interpretation become too bold and does it border up on or turn into a questionable research practices? When does an interpretation become out of bounds, you could say. So here my argument for the value of replication runs counter to both of the aforementioned positions. Um, because I would allow for still having multiple valid interpretations based on the same source material, based on the same method by different historians, but that does not apply that if there are multiple valid answers that every answer is valid, that there are no limits to these interpretations. And I think replication studies then are a way to start the investigation into the limits of these interpretations. Um, and it's important to note, I think as well, that repli replicability is of course already very much implied in the most important accountability mechanism of the historian, which is, I would say, the footnote. Footnotes relate to the historian, one commentator wrote, as the drill relates to the dentist. And I quote, like the high whine of the dentist's drill, the low rumble of the footnote on the historian's page reassures the tedium it inflicts, like the pain inflicted by the drill, is not random but directed, part of the cost that the benefits of modern science and technology exact. And what footnotes do with this, with the tedium they inflict, what they do is in fact, uh, I would say, hand out an invitation to read this because it makes the interpretation of the historian, if not replicable, then at least traceable. And accepting that invitation is what I think that we should do and is exactly what um, my colleagues Pim Heunen, Auke Rijpa and I at Utrecht University will do in co collaboration with a number of research master students because we have now a, a project that will be starting soon in which we will try to replicate a number of important historical studies. Will we then detect cases of norm violation? I do not know. I, I guess not, but we do not know. Um, but I think that by systematically tracing back historians' claims to the material on which they rest, we have a means to open up the process of interpretation, which by and large, I think has remained a black box. And this contribute to a form of open scholarship without necessarily making use of practices which are often implied in replication, such as pre-registration and data, data sharing that seem to be, and all of these practices seem to be much better fit for statistically inclined disciplines, which history in a large part is not. What will be the result of this? I do not know, but I think that is all the more reason to try. Thank you for your attention.